All right, we've uh, I still see people joining us, so we'll probably just continue on, and uh, they will continue to join them. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn about using native plants in your landscape. Before we get started, I know we have a few attendees who are new to Zoom and a Zoom webinar can have a few different features, but uh, this meeting is gonna be recorded. So we will send you a link so you can use this as a resource and maybe even share it with a friend. And the only time we'll be able to see your screen name, image or video is if we open up your mic for a question and you can raise your hand to ask a question. We'll just be do, we'll probably, try to hold your questions until a stopping point. And Greg, if you want to let us know if there's a particular time that works for you. Um, I'm pleased to have a Leaving Time Municipal Water District Board of Director Neil Myers with us tonight. He serves on several board committees, including our Conservation Committee, and would like to welcome you. Uh, thank you, Teresa, and a good late afternoon to everyone. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for attending the uh, native plant workshop this evening. We're doing it by Zoom. Um, hopefully soon we'll be back to having these workshops in the uh, open uh, where we can actually touch and see um, and get to know the native plants and, and the techniques uh, for uh, taking care of them um, a little bit better. But right now we're happy to do this as a Zoom webinar in order to uh, continue to educate everyone. Um, as Teresa noted, my name's Neil Myers. I uh, live in the uh, area around Stagecoach Park near La Costa Canyon High, been here for about 30 years. And I sit on the board of directors of the Levenhine Water District, which is the uh, agency that's sponsoring the uh, seminar today. Um, and uh, again, I wanna thank you for being here. Uh, we have a great speaker in Greg Rubin. Uh, Greg knows about as much about the topic of native plant design and landscape uh, as about anyone in the San Diego, San Diego region and really um, Southern California. He'll tell you a little bit more about his background, but he's, he's a writer, he's a designer, he just uh, knows it all. So it's gonna be very informative and really, I think, helpful for anyone. Um, before we get started with the workshop, um, I just wanted to take a moment to remind, particularly our uh, Olivenhine Water District customers, but really any of you, even if you're not customers of the district, because your own districts most likely have some similar programs about some of the services and incentive programs that we have available for you, um, not only for native plant uh, 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 transitions possibly, but other programs as well. Uh, one of the best programs we have to get started for, for you is a free water use evaluation. And if you uh, go onto our website, uh, which is olivenhine.org, uh, um, and um, uh, uh, sign up. Uh, we'll actually send someone to your home who will spend uh, an hour or two with you going through your whole front yard, backyard, irrigation systems, your controller, um, and we'll provide you with uh, free um, advice as to how to improve your systems and really for conservation purposes and how to best save water and keep all your plants and other shrubbery happy. Um, we also have workshops such as this, again, and tours eventually, botanical gardens and uh, other places where um, you'll learn more about the techniques that are available, not only for native plants, but irrigation and, and other things to, again, help you with conservation and water use. Um, and then really what is, is helpful for everyone are incentives and rebate programs that the district has available. Um, that includes uh, things like um, high efficiency clothes washers, high efficiency toilets, rain barrels. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get enough rain that we can fill up those barrels a little bit. Um, uh, soil moisture sensor systems, weather-based irrigation controllers, rotating nozzles, and then of course, landscape transformations, which I would imagine is the reason why a lot of you are here today to try to find out more about what might, might be available and to potentially transform your lawns, which um, are pretty, but use an awful lot of water, um, into um, other uh, irrigated um, landscape systems that uh, might be just as pretty and work a lot better for conservation, especially since unfortunately, uh, we may be heading back into uh, the dreaded mandated drought restrictions. Let's hope that doesn't happen. We have a surprisingly great winter, but I think it's great that all of you are on board. I think the reason you're all here is that you're thinking ahead 
as to what you might want to do, um, knowing that we've we've got these water shortages that we're dealing with. Um, so again, um, please go to our website, uh, the OMWD website. And for those of you who are not OMWD customers, I encourage you to visit your water agency's website for drought information and the water efficiency programs that they offer. And with that, I'll turn this back over to Teresa, who will introduce Mr. Rubin and enjoy the program. Thank you very much, Director. Now it is our pleasure to introduce President and Founder of California's own Native Landscape Design and Licensed Landscape Contractor who's been working with Native since 1985. By 93, Greg fully transitioned out of his career as an aerospace engineer to devote himself to a successful and unique landscaping business. His company has designed nearly 800 Native Landscapes in Southern California. Specialties include year-round appeal, low maintenance, water efficiency, rich habitat, and fire resistance. Greg has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, San Diego Union Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, and magazines such as Sunset and San Diego Home and Garden. I'd wager a guess that you've seen him on local news outlets like CNN, MSNBC, or on one of his many presentations and workshops throughout Southern California. So without further ado, I'll give you San Diego Horticultural Society's 2018 Horticulturist of the Year, Greg Rubin. I wish I had a drum roll. Take it away, Greg. Thank you so wow, much. Wow, that's quite an introduction. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that, guys. <laughs> well, I'm really honored to be here and uh, really excited to be giving you my presentation, uh, this webinar workshop. It's a bit involved. We touch on a lot of subjects here. And I'm okay with taking uh, questions during the talk because I don't want people to get left behind if they're unsure about their comprehension of a subject. So, you know, um, Teresa, if you just want to let me know if there's pertinent questions out there, I, I don't want people getting lost along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, fire up this. Uh, where is it? Where'd you go to? I just had it a second ago. I'm going to fire up my, my presentation, although, oh, it seems to have Seems to have gone bye bye car. Let me uh, bear bear with me, guys. Just a second here. There we go. Okay, and hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, yes. Great. So anyway, I've uh, thank you for the introduction. I, I actually as Teresa mentioned, I used to be an aerospace engineer and then I made the very logical transition to California Native Landscape Contractor back in the mid 90s. And as she mentioned, we're up to about 800 native landscapes in Southern California. And we've been involved in some really neat projects, including the infield at the Del, Del Mar Thoroughbred Racetrack. Uh, we uh, did the Lux Art Institute and we did a uh, a large development within Aviara called Sanderling. We did their common areas, several acres, and uh, the homeowners just love it. So basically, if you can get Sanderling to go with natives, uh, you can go get anybody to. And uh, proud to mention that um, Lucy Warren and I have written a couple of books that continue to be on the best-selling list on California native plants. The first one was the California Native Landscape came out in 2013. And then 2016, we came out with the Drop Defying California Garden. The first book gets really deeply into the methodology and horticulture of working with native plants, which we're going to talk about tonight. The second book is more of a plant encyclopedia where it touches on the topics, but basically is a plant selector and lists uh, 
230 uh, native plants and gives descriptions and how to use them. All right, so why use native plants? Well, for one thing, we're forgetting what California used to look like. We're so busy turning it into South Florida. So they really give us a sense of place. Uh, certainly when you install a native landscape, you're also creating habitat. There is no habitat that equals a native landscape. These, these landscapes are full of life, full of birds and butterflies and lizards and just a menagerie. Now, when you design them correctly, they are lower maintenance. They're not no maintenance. There's no such thing as a no maintenance landscape if you wanna impress the neighbors, but we do get pretty close. Very importantly, they're 60 to 90 for use. And that is significant. That is incredibly significant. Um, and certainly what's surprising to people is just how fire resistant these landscapes can be. Um, we've actually had a couple dozen homes go through major fire events without the loss of a single home. So uh, we actually were involved in a five-year study with the United States Navy that conducted scientific research into why this is, and we found out that it's all about hydration. Not really about what plants you use, it's much more important to keep them properly hydrated, and it takes so little water to actually hydrate a native landscape. However, there are some misconceptions that we have to overcome. One is that the landscape is going to look dead or dormant half the year. Well, I can tell you if my landscapes look dead or dormant for half the year, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. Uh, as I just mentioned, they do have a reputation for being fire bombs, but it looks like given very light thunderstorm level hydration a few times a month in summer, these landscapes can become some of the most fire resistant landscapes we have. Uh, natives have gotten a undeserved reputation for being difficult, well, they're difficult if you apply ornamental horticulture to native ecology and never the two shall meet. And finally, a lot of people think that natives are simply too large for most yards, which is why I brought this picture of a courtyard landscape to show you there's plenty of native plants that are scaled for even postage stamp sized yards. Okay, so I think to understand how to work with native plants successfully, it's best to understand the underlying ecology. Uh, for one thing, native plants are highly symbiotic. They actually organize themselves into plant communities. And they actually share resources with one another. And they also share water. Uh, by organizing into plant communities, uh, for instance, Del Mar, uh, that would contain maritime chaparral, uh, coastal sage scrub, oak woodland, riparian woodland, and coastal strand. So these are groups of plants that are highly symbiotic. They actually share resources with one another. When you're trying to group plants together, it turns out the most important factor appears to be mulch. There's basically only two types of mulch, either organic or inorganic. An organic mulch would exist in plant communities that are dense and drop a lot of leaves and uh, have a lot of evergreen plants and they form a duff layer around the base of the plants. That would include like chaparral or coastal sage scrub or oak woodland or mixed evergreen forest. Uh, plant communities that don't have such a thick uh, duff layer would include coastal strand and desert and riparian, which is streamside woodland and grassland. And that's because the plants are widely spaced or don't have a lot of biomass. They don't create a lot of their own mulch. And what's very effective when grouping your plants is to simply look at what mulch they like, whether it be organic or inorganic. And five species from a given mulch group is usually sufficient to create the nice biodiversity that keeps it stable. Interestingly, what ties these plant communities together is the soil biology. And this is something that's been really ignored by horticulture until recently. 
Um, some of you may have heard the term mycorrhizae. Uh, the major groups are endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. No, you're not going to be tested on this, but just know that endomycorrhizae uh, forms uh, little vesicles inside the root cells. And there's an exchange of moisture and nutrition that occurs there through the cell membranes, uh, or sorry, within the cells. They actually go right into the cytoplasm of the cells and you have these little vesicles, these little compartments form. And the roots, uh, the fungi are all kind of uh, coiled up in there. So that's the primary fungus for desert and coastal sage scrub. Um, grasslands. The other major group are the ectomycorrhizae, and this fungus actually forms a sheath around the cortical cells, the outer cells of the root hairs, and the exchange is actually um, through the membrane, through the cell membranes. They don't actually penetrate within the cells. And this is the primary fungi for woodlands and forest. And one of the other differences is that endomycorrhizae is completely microscopic. You have to stain and use scanning electron microscopes to see it. Ectomycorrhizae, on the other hand, is more visible, and certainly their fruiting bodies are visible because they're mushrooms. And some of our best eating mushrooms are actually ectomycorrhizae, like truffles, like chanterelles, like morels. There's other uh, really important soil partners too, like Frankia. Frankia is a type of bacterial colony that forms on the cells, on the roots of certain um, groups of plants like Ceanothus or wild lilac. Even though these aren't legumes like in the pea family, they become nitrogen fixers for the plant community through the use of Frankia. Uh, Another important actor would be cryptogamic crust. Many of you that have been out hiking uh, have seen this crust form on the top of the soil, and it's incredibly important to the ecology, but it's also incredibly delicate and get, can get destroyed by a single hoof step. The importance of the crust that forms is that it's actually a little non-vascular plant community unto itself, made up of mosses and lichens and terrestrial algae and cyanobacteria and fungi. And what it does is it actually fixes nitrogen for the whole plant community. It also inhibits the growth of weeds. So the crust is very important to our ecology, but unfortunately is almost always lost whenever there's development or disturbance. So the bottom line, when we design these landscapes, we try to do it in a way that actually emulates California's native ecology as closely as we can anyway, within home landscapes so that these natural processes can actually develop and take hold. All right, so that's about ecology. Let's talk about design. And one of the most important design considerations is that 75% of the plant community should be evergreen, okay? This gets lost on a lot of folks that are just getting into native landscaping. They're so enamored of all the incredible flowers that we have that they end up making the whole landscape nothing but herbaceous perennials like monkey flowers and sages and stuff that looks like a riot of colors in spring but absolute tumbleweeds in fall. So by creating a backbone that's like 75% evergreen, you avoid that dead dormant appearance. It looks good all year long, and you're really paying attention to foliar color and texture that give you year-round interests. And in this photo here, you can see the different shades of green and red and white that are actually foliar effects, but give this landscape pop even when there isn't a lot in bloom. And the other 25% of the plants are your color spot perennials. And those perennials go along the edges, along the paths, along the patios, where you can see that color right up front. And more importantly, when they're done blooming, you can very easily pinch off the dead blooms called deadheading. 
And finally, we mix up plants that bloom at different times of the year. So you pretty much have something blooming all year long. For instance, in this picture here, the seaside daisies are blooming right now. And so are the penstemons. But the hummingbird fuchsia over here won't start blooming, blooming until July, August. This is in spring. And so you have something going off all year long. Now, one of the things that really surprises people are all the different styles that are available with native plants, okay? And the only limit is your imagination. We have literally a native plant for every situation. And so it's really a function of knowing, you know, what plants are actually available and then how to use them. So this might not come to mind right off the top of your head. This is a formal garden. Yet this design right here is composed entirely of native plants. Those cypress along the outside edges are native cypress, like gallons, dwarf cypress. Uh, the little uh, box hedges are made up of small manzanitas like green sphere or uh, red berry. The beautiful spherical pink flowered plants are Santa Cruz Island buckwheat. And behind the reflecting pool, we actually have what looks like ivy, but it's in fact Catalina Evergreen prefer Perfume Current. But what really defines this as a formal garden is not just the plantings, it's actually the props, the features. It's like a movie set, okay? So the fact that we have this linear central path with a, with a small central, uh, courtyard area and a reflecting pool and a statue, um, that all screams formal. So do the linear and box arrangements of the native plants. So do these little trees right here, which are actually Catalina cherry, or this middle sort of uh, pyramidal uh, shrub right here, which could be a sunset manzanita that's been sheared. So very attainable native plants. I will tell you though, that there is nothing low maintenance about this landscape. But you know, if you have the need to make your yard look like something out of Versailles, you can actually do it with native plants. Now, in a similar vein, we have contemporary landscapes. I get requests for a lot of these. And again, what's important here is sort of the rectilinear nature, the layering, um, the linear, aspects, a lot of the plants themselves are linear, like uh, these agaves over here, or the bear grass, or uh, some of the yuccas. Um, and they, they're, they're typically arranged in geometric rows. So is the hardscape. And we're still even using a lot of the same plants as our formal garden, like the cypress here. Um, like some of the smaller manzanita. But again, the arrangements are very linear and clean. Uh, one aspect that, so a lot of these plants would typically like more of an organic mulch, but when I'm doing uh, uh, this kind of a contemporary style landscape, I typically compromise and I use gravel. Gravel is a top of type dress, type of top dressing that is been really associated with contemporary style landscapes. So that's one of the only concessions I make. But beyond that, they're all native plants. They're just arranged differently and you're paying attention to plant selection. Now, this type of Mediterranean landscape, you'd think is really a slam dunk, but there are aspects to it that define it. Certainly the staging is important. You know, these, these saltillo tiles, diamond shaped uh, settings, um, the, the ornate fountain in the middle, the uh, rustic uh, 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 arbor at the back. Only on this arbor, instead of a European bay tree, we actually have a California bay tree. And on the arbor, we have growing our native wild grape called Rogers Red that turns brilliant burgundy and red in fall and has very edible fruit. We've even made wine out of it, which was drinkable. But notice that the plantings now are softer and more billowy. There's a little bit of massing going on. Um, 
Also notice what we've incorporated in the corners here, which are citrus. Citrus actually plug into these native landscapes quite nicely. They just want a little extra water, but it turns out they do like the same fungi, the same mycorrhizae as the native plants. And I can tell you that unless you're gonna open up a fruit stand, use dwarf citrus. There'll be more than enough fruit for a single family. So, but boy, they're, they're really colorful and they lend a lot of character and interest to a Mediterranean style native landscape. So quite often when people think native landscape, they actually think cactus and succulents and desert. I even had a client in Rancho Santa Fe who I went out and saw yesterday and they said, well, we called you because we understand that you're an expert on cactus and succulents. And I said, no, actually I'm an expert on California native landscapes. I can do beautiful Southwestern landscapes, but most of our plant materials are actually sort of woodsy and shrubs and shrubland type species and trees. But if you want a Southwestern landscape, we can certainly do that with a native palette. And, you know, we have an incredible model just beyond our mountains here out in Anza Borrego and the Sonoran Desert. And you see a lot of those elements in this design here, uh, like the Acatillos. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, Desert Museum Palo Verdes and a desert willow surrounding this ramada here, this rustic ramada. But notice the materials. <laughs> notice that the mulch is not a redwood mulch like we normally use, it's actually uh, sand, rocks, and gravel. And then I use a contrasting color of DG to create the meandering pathways. And in the back corner here, we've got a fire pit with benches punctuated by boulders. And then behind this, we have a plant that is little known, little appreciated, but it's an incredible plant, and that's the desert or New Mexico olive which has brilliant white bark and tops out about 12 to 15 feet. It's like the perfect multi-trunk small tree for courtyards. It's very adaptable. It's very easy. It's very drop tolerant. It has nice fall color. It turns brilliant yellow in fall just before it drops its leaves. Most of the plants are males. They don't even have fruit, but some people actually want fruiting desert olives, which is fine. There are varieties out there that are female and the birds usually strip them before they ever hit the ground. And they're just little tiny berries. They're not, they're distantly related to olives, but boy, what, this is a tree that I'm really trying to popularize. And also notice how spread out the plants are. Uh, desert is low on resources. And so you give more real estate to each of the individual plants. But finally, when we're talking styles, I tried to think of one that would just blow people's paradigms. You know, what one garden style would you just never associate with native plants? And of course, that is a Japanese garden. However, when I design Japanese gardens, I actually have trouble cutting down the number of species that would work. Again, it's about the props, it's the setting. You know, the fence, the gate, the flagstone pathway, that bridge, the lantern, the water feature, the boulders, the deck, the tea house. Even if it didn't have a single plant in it, this would still screen a Japanese or Asian style garden. But then we have a whole plant palette to work with. Okay, over here we have uh, a native dogwood. We have several species. Uh, back over here, I love, instead of the Japanese maple, I love to use um, our, our miniature box elder, which looks very much like a Japanese maple, only it is much more drought tolerant and heat tolerant. And over here, uh, instead of a Japanese black pine, I'm using either a shore pine or we're just introducing a new variety of miniature bishop pine from Baja that's also very heat and drought tolerant, but they're almost perfect analogs for uh, the Japanese black pine. 
In addition, we have uh, plants like our bush anemone and our native iris, which are evergreen, um, manzanitas. Uh, we, we've, we've got no shortage of plants that would be incredibly suitable in a Japanese garden setting. If you think I'm crazy, you think that's a pipe dream, well, here's what we did in the, at the uh, San Diego County Fair in 2013. It was a Japanese garden with all California native plants. I mean, look at that beautiful boxed manzanita right there that was actually salvaged from a construction site near Julian. And then also uh, the bonsai, that is the bonsai, that is the featured plant inside the tea house here is actually a native lemonade berry. Here's another angle on it. We didn't do a wet water feature. We didn't want to hassle with that. So we used that as an opportunity to create a Zen garden with the raked uh, sand gravel. Uh, you know, you put the ripples in it. We even made this little sort of authentic rake here to do that. And these rocks are uh, reminiscent of islands and these incredible lanterns uh, were made by Laird Plumley in Encinitas, who does incredible work and are a synthesis of both Asian and craftsman styles with oak leaves and tori pines and uh, just incredibly beautiful fusion of elements. In fact, in fact this landscape display was titled California Fusion. So and we won about nine awards for it. We're really proud of it. There's another look going towards the, the, the tea house, which is still uh, in existence. It's actually over at the San Diego Botanic Garden, kind of ironically located in the bamboo section, but um, still in existence and it was a collaboration with the San Diego Botanic Garden, some incredible carpenters and craftsmen that I had at my disposal to work with to put this display together. So, you know, let's say that we want to go ahead and start installing a native landscape. How do we do it? How do we get the site ready? Well, certainly, you know, we go in there and we clean up everything. We remove the old landscape. We take out all the undesirable plants and weeds, and we try to take out as much of the roots as we can. Now, if we have mature trees on site, I take that on a, an, in, an individual basis because some trees just are not, they're too aggressive to be put with our native plant, plants, which are not aggressive. Uh, there are other trees like crepe myrtles, that have fairly benign root system, systems and I can work with them. So it just depends on the trees. Um, then you kill the lawn by whatever socially acceptable moral methodology you choose to use. And we usually cut out the sod about two inches below the surface because we like to get rid of all that bacteria and pathogens and uh, fertilizer and salts and everything. And we'll go, if we have room, we'll go create a compost pile for the old turf and it breaks down pretty rapidly. And you can use that to create a raised bed vegetable garden, say, uh, in a few months. Uh, we'll remove whatever other features you're not keeping, you know, old walkways or landscape fabric. We do not use landscape fabric in these landscapes. You want, you want a clean, unhindered interface between the mulch and the substrate. We might take out gravel if we don't want it. Uh, certainly, we typically get rid of the gnomes and pink flamingos at this point. Uh, although I can, I have my price, I guess I can be talked into leaving those. Then we'll do our rough grading to establish our basic contours. And then we'll our, install our flat work, our rocks and paths, and then we'll do the irrigation. You want to do the irrigation afterwards because you don't want to set a 300 pound boulder on top of your new sprinkler system and potentially crush it. Uh, but when you're laying flat work, you, it's very important, especially when you're pouring concrete, to put a uh, you know, piece of three or four inch grain pipe underneath it going to 
from the main area to isolated planters so that you can run infrastructure through it later. That's something that most uh, installers do not do. Uh, you need to ask them and you need to be insistent about, please put sleeves in so you can run your irrigation, electrical, whatever later on and get underneath the concrete. And it's inexpensive to do, it's really not a big deal. Um, here are some different features that we like to include. This is how we like to do our paths. Um, I love decomposed granite paths. We don't use edging typically. Um, we actually just dome the path and we use stabilized decomposed granite that wet compacts to nearly concrete consistency. And we feather it out on the edges and then we run the mulch right up to the edge of the DG and we're done. And these paths last, oh, I've got some out there that are 20 years old that are just fine. They look almost brand new. And maybe occasionally I'll have them run a lawn rake over it to kind of smooth them out a little bit, but they are very hard. They're very consolidated, very compact and very durable and relatively inexpensive. And they look like it's just a natural garden trail. Um, certainly flagstone is a great material. It's beautiful. It is expensive, um, but you know, if you have it in the budget, you can make very, very dramatic flat surfaces using uh, grouted uh, flagstone. So that's another possible choice. Um, we like to do steps. We often do steps with timber and backfill with decomposed granite. We'll use, say, three foot lengths of rebar and then screw everything together to stabilize it. But, you know, we've, this, this whole landscape here was about a half acre of very steep hillside with paths and steps running all throughout and changes in level. Um, a lot of times when we do steps, uh, we like to use the metal, prefabricated metal risers that are out there. Um, maybe put uh, wood railing on it. This is actually a before picture of a very steep bluff that we landscaped in downtown San Diego. Very unstable uh, uh, cliffs, basically. And uh, here's a picture of it about a year and a half later. And it's almost completely filled in. The wild grapes have stabilized the slopes and actually grown on the wire railing. And uh, this is incredibly stabilizing the slope. And what's not only just the plant cover and the roots, but actually that mycorrhizal fungi completely permeates the upper three feet of soil and is very important to soil stabilization. That's why you don't typically see landslides in the chaparral. Uh, we're kind of known for our boulder work. We love to work with large boulders. Um, you know, it's a waste of time to work with anything under about two foot in most of these landscapes because they'll get completely grown over by the plants. So if you really want to continue to make a statement, use larger boulders. Um, here we had some natural boulder outcroppings to work with, but then we actually added smaller boulders into this sort of rock wall to both retain the soil and to create visual interest and create planting pockets. And then we ran this path right along the front of it. So it's a very dramatic portion of this landscape up in, uh, up in Laguna. So uh, actually Corona del Mar. We're very proud of this. And this has been on a couple of garden tours. We're also known for our dry streams. We love to do dry streams. Um, we've always called them dry streams. Uh, one of the more common terms now is bioswells, but it's all the same. Basically you wanna slow down runoff and allow it to percolate into the landscape. And it's really important to do streams that actually look like streams rather than ditches full of rocks. So we kind of pride ourselves in how we set our boulders. These do eat a lot of rock. Um, this, this one on the right 
is part of a complex of over 300 feet of dry streams and accordingly ate about 300 cubic yards, about 400 tons of boulders. So yes, they do consume a lot of rock when you do them right, but you really want them to look like the real deal. So even rock retaining walls are fun to do. Um, a lot of times we'll actually do like a cinder block core and then use straps and rebar in that to actually attach the mortar for the rocks. And when we do the rocks, we like to recess the mortar into the crevices so it looks like a natural uh, stacked rock wall. We're also finding this to be a very effective way to do um, retaining walls where we use lengths of uh, six inch or four inch uh, C chan or sorry, I-beams, steel I-beams, and we sink them about halfway into the soil with uh, concrete footings. And then we take our four by 12 pressure treated and simply slip it into the channels and get a nice, tight, very powerful, um, very effective retaining wall. So we've done that quite a bit. Or dry stack, we do a lot of work with dry stack and with uh, pavers. This is in Poway. And uh, this also can create some really incredible effects and really uh, nice, we like to use like a country manor, which has more of a Celtic stone look to it. And there's even some blocks that look very much like modern type architecture. All right, so we do our features, then that brings us to irrigation, right? How do we do irrigation? Well, this might surprise you, but whenever possible, we try to avoid doing drip systems. We found we've had mortality issues uh, with drip, especially single point drip emitters. Um, and in the whole spirit of trying to emulate nature, the way we like to water our native plants is overhead like rainfall. And one of the best ways to achieve that is with these MP rotator type systems, which put out, in this case, about 0.39 inches of equivalent precipitation an hour. And we put them in 12 inch pop-ups with a built-in 40 PSI regulator. And then we use uh, what's called a swing joint. You know, you remember the old days where there was a T, a riser and a head, and God forbid you trip on that thing, you're gonna be digging up 10 feet of pipe on either side just to put a new T in there and to uh, put a new head only to have some kid come along, run their bike over it. So when you use a swing joint, you're actually isolating any forces that this head might see from the PVC and the T's and elbows no longer go straight up, they actually go sideways. And you have this additional 12 inch piece of what we call funny pipe, which is flexible. And say you're like me and you plant a sage right in front of the sprinkler head. Uh, it took me a long time to learn that when you're using sprinklers, you don't wanna plant the plant right in front of it. But let's say you make that mistake, um, you can actually pull this straight out of the ground and raise it up so that the top of the head is right at the level of the shrub. And then the pop-up comes up an additional 12 inches, waters everything, and then disappears into the shrub. So there's a lot of strategies for dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, you know, certainly we use drip emitters. We we'll use it on conventional landscape plants and veggies and roses and fruit trees. They're all pretty tolerant of that. Plus there's situations where you might have a, you know, a planter that's less than two feet wide and you just can't get any kind of a real effective sprinkler system. Maybe you can put micro sprays that go side to side between each set of plants, or that's a case where we might use like a grid type netifim system. But in general, if it's at least 25 by 25 feet, we try to use these overhead sprinklers that are highly efficient, in fact, use as little even less water than some of these drip grid systems. Um, so micro sprays are great if you have an existing drip system, you wanna convert it to overhead. Uh, it's a very effective and uh, fairly simple uh, conversion to do so you don't have to put in a whole new sprinkler system if you're already stuck with drip. 
but they really do prefer rain and they prefer overhead. So we plant, we try to space out for final size. Uh, we look at about a, well, just, you know, think about, about what the size of the plant's gonna be in five to seven years. Um, typical spacing is anywhere from five to eight feet. And um, these things grow incredibly fast. Uh, we also typically use smaller plants for natives. There are a few exceptions. Some slower growing plants might actually create more of a, a structure to the landscape in 15 or 24 inch, uh, like some of the manzanitas and oaks. But in general, you're using one or five gallon plants. They establish much better and they catch up to the larger plants very quickly within a year usually. And uh, we space, like I said, for final size. So when we're done, you know, it looks like a sea of mulch with little green tufts in it. But I tell the clients, call me in three months, let me know how it's going. And usually stuff's grown in by 50%. Okay, so let's talk about the actual planting process. Um, I want to stop here just for a second. Uh, Teresa, is my audio coming through okay? Yes, indeed. Okay, very good. I had a, uh, I, I had a little uh, error message that said it had switched over onto a different microphone, so I just want to make sure. Good. All right. We can hear you. Excellent. So in planting, okay, so we plant natives a little differently than your typical garden plant. Okay, uh, kind of try to stay with me on this. Uh, it's a little different. Basically, when we plant natives, we dig a hole and stick them in. Um, we don't use fertilizer. We don't usually use soil amendments. We don't use plant tabs. What they want is clean, lean, mean soil, okay? Uh, we do like to make the, the hole actually a little bit shallow so that the level of the soil in the pot is about a half inch to an inch above the surrounding soil. Because over time, that root ball will settle and you don't wanna end up with a native in the bottom of the hole. And when we backfill, we'll put the soil in with our fingers, kind of force it in around the root ball and then maybe tamp it down with our feet. Um, you might create a temp temporary basin at this point for the initial watering, which is pretty heavy to get them established. And you have to do that on slopes. You have to create some kind of a temporary basin around the plants. Um, and then if we have six to 12 inch boulders, we'll put them right on the root ball, not a campfire ring. I mean, right on the root ball, just leave enough room for the stem to grow coming out of there. They love that. It protects the plants. It keeps them cool, keeps the moisture in. And uh, it like, looks kind of cool. And the plants can even pull a little bit of nutrition off the bottom of those rocks through the mycorrhizal fungi. And then the most important function when planting native plants is to water, water, water. I mean, that day, one to five gallons in clay soil, five to 30 gallons in well-draining sandy soil per each one gallon plant that day. That means you have to circle through that planting a bunch of times, but that is really the best way to remove air pockets from around the root ball and settle the soil. This is so important. It's like bare root roses. You need to get those air pockets out of there. This is actually the most important watering these plants will ever see. And before we put down the mulch, this is actually a good time to put down a pre-emergent. It actually doesn't harm the growing plants. It kills the seed bank. You may have 10 to 100,000 dormant weed seeds per cubic foot. Okay, so the pre-emergent, often in a granular form, you can put down right over the new plant and it doesn't harm anything, but it uh, will go after the weed seed and get rid of about 80% of the annual weeds. It's, it's very effective, very helpful. Now we talked about organic mulch. This is what we like to use for our organic mulch. It's the shredded redwood bark. I want to say that we're not cutting down redwood forest to create this stuff. It's actually a byproduct 
of the milling industry that used to be burned. So rather than turn it into greenhouse gases, we actually very effectively use it for the initial emulation of the duff layer in these sort of chaparral, woodland, shrubland uh, plantings. And because it's redwood, it lasts a long time, up to 10 years on the ground. It holds its color very well. And you can see behind there, it sticks to slopes very nicely. We usually put it down three to four inches deep. And with our overhead watering for our MP rotators, it compacts down to about an inch deep or so. It is an amazing erosion control. And one of the big knocks on this stuff is everybody's complaining that it's uh, a real fire hazard. Well, I can tell you in all of our landscapes that have been in the back country that have burned in these fires, and by burned, I mean smoldered, we didn't lose a single structure and the flame height is typically about two inches. And it's very easy to stop by raking the flame front towards the uh, black singed mulch. That pretty much stops the progression of the flames. And um, the key to all of this is consolidation. So if you look on the slopes behind the fresh pile there, you'll see that it's actually condensed down like, like carpet. And at that point, it's very poorly oxygenated and doesn't burn worth the dark. So very important, the consolidation aspect is key to creating a poorly oxygenated uh, top dressing that is very appropriate to the biochemistry and ecology of the native shrubland species. And then if you're doing inorganic mulch, we're usually using sand, rocks, pebbles, sometimes nothing at all. And virtually any native, whether it's shrubland, whether it's desert, they do love having these six to 12 inch boulders placed right on their root balls. Okay, I'm gonna talk about some of our plants. This is just a very, very small selection of the thousands of species we have available. Uh, I touched on this earlier. This is a box elder. Now this is a full size one, but we've been using one in the trade called Birch Toy Box Elder. And it's only about 15 to 20 feet tall, but the leaves are just like, almost like a Japanese maple. It has a very delicate structure that belies its heat and drought tolerance. And it's wonderful in any kind of a woodland garden or a Japanese garden. They're just great. And I really like to use the miniature one, not these huge straight species. Of course, sycamores, fantastic bark, big, fast growing trees that can grow 12 feet a year. Uh, the bark is, mottled white. Um, they glow when you uplight them at night and incredibly important wildlife plants. Um, very fast growing. I got three in my yard that were one gallon plants in 1996 and now they're pushing through 85 feet tall. Uh, they make a statement. You need to have the room for these because they can be 40 to 60 feet across in addition. But wow, what a, what a tree. Uh, when you want to use it. They are susceptible to anthracnose. Most trees in residential neighborhoods have that disease. Uh, however, there are some really good treatments for it, including phosphorus acid and a product called actinovate, which go after the pathogen. Uh, a really beautiful evergreen tree is our Santa Cruz Island ironwood. It has ferny leaves. It's very ancient. There's fossils of this going back 50 million years. And it only resides on a couple of the Channel Islands now. It used to cover the western half of the United States. But as we dried out after the last ice age, uh, they retreated just to the islands where it's a little bit foggier and cooler and wetter. So, but it's a beautiful, brilliant, narrow, lovely specimen, ferny tree. Uh, that does great, especially in landscape situations where they naturally get just a little bit more water typically and they have mulch. This is an amazing tree that nobody knows about. This is the island oak. Again, a prehistoric tree, goes back 50 million years. Everything about it is dinosaur-like, including the enormous leaves that start out bronze when they emerge. And look at the size of those acorns. That's my hand right there. So giant acorns with a woolly cap 
these huge luscious leaves. And also notice that unlike most oak trees, which are broad, this tends to grow vertically and is much narrower than it is tall, which makes it very useful in a lot of situations that where you don't have as much room, even smaller yards. And it can grow fast. It can grow six feet a year. So it is quite a tree. It should be more widely available out there. And I'm trying to work to hopefully make that happen. But what a great tree this is. Even in the same plant, this is actually my office, guys. And uh, in front, next to the uh, island oak, uh, these actually grow naturally with it on, I believe, San Miguel Island, are Torrey pines. Torrey pines are one of our fastest growing pine trees. And even though they tend to be shorter in stature next to the coast because they're constantly hit with sea wind, when you bring them inland, they're rocket ships and they can grow easy six feet a year. And I've seen them over 100 feet tall. So here they are together. And even on the right side is a little, uh, one of our big leaf maples. It's actually a true maple that um, I, I have all these growing in Escondido. And uh, they're quite a sight. Here's one I'd wish people would use. There's actually a really great hybrid a natural hybrid of the Oregon and the Arizona ash. And it's, it's a cross between Fraxinus velatina and Fraxinus latifolia. And not only it, does it not get enormous, not only is it not nearly as messy as these shamel European weed ashes, but it stays a reasonable size. And I've used this as a courtyard tree. And then look at the fall color you get out of it. So again, guys, there's all these great native trees out there that nobody knows about that should be more widely used. And that's kind of my mission out here is to get you introduced to this stuff and then hopefully they'll start growing them because availability is the issue pretty much now. But what a wonderful drought tolerant, heat tolerant, uh, small ash tree with great fall color. And this is um, Catalina cherry. This is great for those people that just got to have a ficus, an evergreen with shiny green leaves. Um, looks from a distance exactly like a ficus, only it's not, and it doesn't have the nasty roots, it doesn't need the water, and it actually has edible cherries. Now the cherries, the meat is kind of thin on these, the pit is huge, but the cherry tastes like a bing cherry when it's fully ripe very sweet, and the indigenous people would actually scrape off the meat, make cherry wine out of it, and then they would grind and leach the pits to make the most amazing cherry marzipan you could ever imagine. I've had it, and it's delicious. So this is an incredible evergreen native tree, fairly fast growing, very neat, very shiny, and it actually has edible cherries on top of it, and boy, the birds love this thing too. So. You know, again, another very un underutilized, unknown tree. And this is one of my favorite Palo Verdes. This is called Desert Museum. And the great thing about this is it doesn't have spines. And it's covered in flowers. It's actually a three-way cross between our native Circidiums and then the uh, Parkinsonia from Arizona. And boy, this, is, this to me is the choice Palo Verde to use in landscapes. And these things are so adaptable. I mean, you could plant them in the middle of the lawn, you could plant them in the middle of the desert, they don't care. And they just do their thing. And without the spines, there's no nastiness to them. And they bloom their hearts out in spring. This is that tree I'm really trying to popularize. This is the Forestiera Neo-Mexicana, the desert olive. It's in the background here. It is like the perfect courtyard tree, and it's just starting to turn its fall color here. And the white bark, you uplight these things and it just glows. It is just a wonderful, unknown courtyard, small scale tree for planters and tighter spaces. And it's so dramatic and gorgeous, just love it. In small evergreen trees, you can actually use uh, some of our wild lilacs, Ceanothus. If you don't remember the name Ceanothus, think Ceanothus. 
This is Ceanothus cyaneus, which believe it or not, is located in a very tight distribution in the middle of Lakeside, actually in El Capitan Park. This thing looks like a upside down wisteria. Those flower clusters are a foot long. It is considered to be one of the most beautiful wild lilacs in the world and it's native right here and it is tough as nails. It gets big and it gets big fast. It can grow six to eight feet a year, very glossy green leaves and these incredible flowers in spring. It just, it's an amazing small tree, large shrub. Great for screening shrub too and it's evergreen. Of course, then we have manzanitas like Dr. Hurd. Uh, these are fairly fast growing. These can grow three feet a year when they're happy. And of course, it has that true manzanita bark and the big manzanita leaves and white flowers and nice big berries. It's just a showpiece all year long and should really be utilized more. It's a perfect patio tree. Sort of larger screening shrubs like Julia Phelps here. This thing gets so covered in blooms, it, you don't even see the foliage most of the time when it's blooming. And the color is intense, just intense. Um, here's a local native that nobody knows about. It's called the summer holly. Uh, look at the flowers on there. It's actually related to manzanita and madrones. It's somewhere in between. And not only does it get covered in white flowers, uh, but in summer, these flowers turn into edible red berries, akin to kind of what you see on the strawberry trees, but much smaller. The birds go crazy on this thing. It's elegant, it's evergreen, it's not a barn burner. It's not the fastest growing plant, but it's a great uh, small tree, large shrub to use in like uh, kind of um, tighter planters and for screening bathroom windows and stuff like that. It's just amazing, I wish people would use more of these. And here's another very popular native called flannel bush. Um, look at that coloration, the golden, the orange, and the olive drab. What a beauty. And these, along with Ceanothus, are incredibly popular in all places but England, or of all places in England. English have been growing California natives for since 1820s, uh, 175 years, and unbeknownst to our own horticulture. And the English gardens are full of California native plants. They think us Yanks are out of our minds that we don't use our own native plants here. They love them there. This one is also very popular there and they like to espalier it on walls. They tie it up and flatten it against walls with maybe some of that deep blue ceanothus in front of them. You, you've got a showstopper. Um, this has got a reputation for being a little difficult, but it really isn't. I'm going to tell you why in a minute when I get to it. Talk about foliar color. Look at this paradise manzanita. That's the new foliage. It is just intense. It looks like it's in bloom, but in fact, you're getting color from foliage, which means no work, no maintenance, year round color. So wonderful plant, the paradise manzanita. Very easy too. And the bush poppy. This is actually a true poppy that's in a bush form that comes. We have some on the mainland. This form comes from the Channel Islands. Gorgeous flowers that are covered cover these shrubs almost all year long and you have these sulfur yellow flowers with orange stamens and blue leaves. These are a prized plant. Everybody wants these. They're a little difficult to propagate so they're never in huge supply but if you can get your hands on it grab it. Here's sort of a medium shrub. I use this a lot in very formal plantings. This is the Santa Cruz Island buckwheat and um, has pinkish flowers, start out white, and they fade to kind of a rust color and sort of a patchwork quilt. And they grow like this. These aren't trimmed, but they just grow in these beautiful sort of spherical blobs. And they're just lovely in, for, in formal landscapes. And then ground covers. We actually have some local species like Delmar manzanita, rare and endangered. I discovered a prostrate form uh, up in Rancho Santa Fe growing on some bluffs. It was about a foot tall and very silver and it's just a lovely ground cover. I'm trying to get it reintroduced into the trade right now. So, so it's pretty rare in San Diego County to actually have evergreen native ground covers. This is one of them. And then look at this manzanita. This is Carmel Sur. I mean, 
not only is it a beautiful native ground cover, it's just a beautiful ground cover, period. I mean, who needs myoporum when you have this? A lot less water, a lot less disease, and just gorgeous with white flowers and red berries. So this is a plant that really should be used much more. And this is my go-to plant on exposed slopes, hot slopes. It is one of the greatest slope stabilizers. It is bright green, it is evergreen, uh, very easy to hydrate, which makes it quite fire resistant and a really great mycorrhizal plant that's a pioneer plant. It helps jumpstart the native ecology and that mycorrhizal fungi just helps stabilize steep slopes. So this is a real go-to plant for me in those situations. So is Yankee Point. You can see this is a Cianophis. This is in Rancho Santa Fe and we're covering steep slopes with our Torrey Pines there. And it is very dramatic and lovely. And if you were to go to Yankee Point, California near Monterey, this is what it looks like. And then finally, our color spots that go along the edges. So California fuchsia, um, Epilobium canum, this is the hummingbird plant for fall in Southern California. It blooms in summer, fall, when a lot of stuff isn't blooming. And boy, do the hummingbirds cover it. So do butterflies. There's a lot of butterflies that love this plant. You just put it along the edges, and when the other stuff's going down, this stuff is going into bright bloom. Love the seaside daisy. Oh my God, what a what a show these put on. They glow. They're so they're so bright and cheery. And if you deadhead them, uh, they'll bloom pretty much all year long. So this is another very useful perennial along edges in gardens. And of course, the penstemon, this is Margarita Bop. Again, you're looking at a color spot in the landscape here along edges. And we've got the seaside daisy, the bops, and then the yellow monkey flower in back of it there. So you contain the maintenance to a fairly isolated area, but man, what a spot of color. It's just brilliant. So maintenance, that brings us to maintenance. Um, these are truly lower maintenance landscapes. Uh, the evergreen plants, the manzanitas, the wild lilacs, ceanothus, require very little in the way of pruning if you've spaced them out for final size. Uh, really, most of the maintenance, the, the pruning, is involved in deadheading perennials and cleaning up sages after they're done blooming. In both cases, I actually like to leave dead flowers on for a while for the seed to ripen because a lot of seed eating birds love those. But then once they pretty well strip the plants, I come in and then we cut off all the dead flower stalks, which cleans them up and gets them ready for a new bloom next year. And they look nice and neat. Um, other than that, you know, I might do some shaping or removing of dead branches and thinning to accent the structure of the plants. However, we've got to talk about what is a gigantic threat to horticulture, to agriculture, and to native landscapes. This is what has typically killed our native plants. Uh, only people didn't realize it and they would blame the mortality on just being short-lived or difficult. Ceanothus is classic. If you read descriptions of Ceanothus, everybody will tell you they live 10 to 15 years. Well, guess what? In the wild, they live 50 to 100 years. And here's the difference. It's, it's ornamental horticulture, it's residential pathogens in residential neighborhoods, nasty soil, and salt, and over fertility. And unfortunately, one of the real vectors for pathogens are Argentine ants. Just about everybody has these small brown ants that get into your kitchens and bathrooms. And they're probably one of the single greatest threats to native landscapes and horticulture in general, and certainly in a, they're, they're wrecking havoc in our agricultural citrus industry, where they're helping to move Asian citrus silk around and protecting them and rearing them. So they're a real problem that needs to be taken seriously, and most people just treat them as this sort of background noise nuisance. Well, what you're looking at here is a root of a dead mallow. And those bumps on there that look like barnacles are actually scale. And scale drill into the, into the uh, what's called the phloem where the water and sugar is conducted. They suck out the moisture and sugars 
Only in this case, it's being done underground where you don't see it. So that's the ants are creating these uh, chambers, hollowing out the dirt, which also will physically destabilize the plants and cause them to be loose in the soil often. And then they'll plaster this, the roots with scale and aphids, which then deplete the moisture and sugar from the plants. And while doing this, they'll also inoculate pathogens directly into the phloem from diseased plants that they move over from. So they, you know, they kill one plant and they move over to the next one. They bring all their diseases and all their nasty bugs with them. And the reason they have this relationship with scale is because uh, scale and aphids secretes something called honeydew, which is near pure sugar and amino acids. That's what they're after. And the ants are farmers. And they protect these things with their lives. They clean them, they rear them, they place them, they move them. And in fact, without the ant intervention, a lot of the scale sometimes goes away, okay? But ants do everything in their nature to try and not let that happen. And ants are so horrible that they do other things. They actually will drive off beneficial pollinators because they want to steal the nectar from the flowers themselves because it's sugary. They spread diseases, as we talked about. They also plant weeds like crazy. And the reason they plant weeds is twofold. They eat the little attachment point of the seed, not the seed itself. And they'll drop that seed outside their nests and their uh, trails. And then when the plants come up, they've got another plant that they can jump over to once they've killed the main plant, they're working. And so when you see a, a shrub or a ground cover, you see, for instance, African belt grass or uh, scarlet pimpernel or different spurges growing right out of the base of the thing with hardly any weeds around the outside. They're all coming right out of the base that's telling you there's actually an ant nest in there because they've dropped the seed and it's coming up around the base. And once they've killed that main plant, they can move over to the weeds instantaneously and start farming them. You know, there's a couple strategies in dealing with. They, um, to control their numbers, you wanna use a baiting strategy. But if you have a plant that's effective and starting, affected and starting to die, you need to use active intervention. You need to treat it in order to save that dying plant. And what you have to do is you have to target the queens instead of the workers, all right? So the queens are deep in the nest and they can live upwards of 15 years where workers will only live 40 days, all right? And each queen can pump out up to 800 babies a month. And there can be like eight queens for every thousand workers. I mean, it's, it's amazing how pervasive these species are. It's considered one of the most invasive species in the world. It's on all continents except Antarctica. So what you use are dilute bait systems that the workers actually bring back and feed to the queen. So you don't, the problem with like taro ant bait that you get at Home Depot, it's 5.4% it's boric acid. That's actually way too high. You want it down around 1% or even half a percent because you want to give the workers time to bring that bait back to the queen and keep dosing the queens by accumulation. You don't want to kill workers. You want them working for you. And the problem with a lot of these ant baits is that they're so effective, they kill thousands of workers. They'll plug up the bait stations, but the queens are left alone and they're still producing hundreds of babies a month and the ants come back in two to three weeks. So as far as, you know, the baiting option, this is my favorite stuff right here. It's called Advion Ant Bait Arena. Okay, and it's got a little, pocket of peanut butter laced with the active ingredient, which is the same insecticide used on uh, cat uh, flea um, solution, the stuff you put on the nape of the neck of your cats, the same. So it's very, very dilute and uh, is really tolerated uh, well by most animal species. And it works very slowly, but that's what you want. And so the peanut butter has both sugar and protein because ants go back and forth between protein and sugar. They also make an ant gel 
and I'll squirt a little bit of that gel inside around this bait holder. The gel is more of a sugar solution. And so now they've got a real choice. They got sugar and they got protein. And depending on what mood they are, what their needs are, they'll go after one or the other and it's almost irresistible. And so this is actually my favorite baiting solution. Uh, you can get it online. I think Amazon carries it, uh, very effective. Uh, for larger properties, for ranches, agricultural, larger yards, this is an, a little different approach. This is gourmet, now called Greenway liquid ant bait. Uh, I dilute it 50-50 with uh, distilled water. You don't want to use city water with chlorine. The ants will avoid it. And then I fill up these bait stations called the K&M Ant Pro. They sell other ones that are sort of similar. And you locate these in a grid about 50 feet apart in, in shade if you can provide or put a bucket over it, a tilted bucket to shade it. Because if they get too hot, the ants won't go near it. But this is also very effective as well, although you don't see quite the same numbers that you do with the Advion ant bait stations. These k &M stations actually take a little longer, but they are kind of working all the time in the background. They really knock down the numbers. They're, they're actually effective over time. So that's... Uh, control strategy, bait strategy. But when you have a dying plant, you got to jump in and do a root soak. You have to do a treatment. And one of these plants that has a bad reputation for being difficult is this Santa Cruz Island uh, ironwood. And, you know, people didn't know what was going on. So once it started dying, they just let it die. They didn't have any options, okay? Well, in this case, we actually did a root soak uh, we use a, a three-way solution that is non-systemic, okay? This was very important to get away from systemic insecticides like neonics, like the imidacloprid, towards a contact-only solution. And so this uses a, a mix of pyrethroid, which is based on natural pyrethrin, uh, neem oil, which is a fungicide miticide, and um, superthrive which actually helps stimulate the roots to recover. And once we do a root soak with these, we've had astounding recoveries in most cases. So that's the same, that's the same tree uh, less than six months later. So it was on its way out over here. We did the root treatment and here it is. It's put on growth, it's happy. Um, made a big difference and no one really was able to save these before. Um, flannel bush, the same thing. So flannel bush have this undeserved reputation for being difficult. Well, it turns out that it's a mallow and ants really love to go after mallows. And so this was the case here. It was starting to die back. The leaves were dehydrated. So was the bark because it wasn't getting enough moisture or sugar anymore. We gave it the treatment and here it is about four months later, luscious and beautiful and covered in flowers. And again, no one's really been able to save these things before. It's been very gratifying to have a way to do this. Uh, another one that has a reputation for being very short-lived is Ceanothus, the wild lilac. And again, in 2018, we were in the process of losing this. Uh, if I hadn't have done anything, it'd probably be dead in about three months. We did the treatment and here it is a few months later, happy and covered in flowers and it's thriving to this day. I planted this thing back about 2012. It's about uh, nine years old now and just keeps growing and flowering and looks wonderful. This is a tree form of our wild lilac, which is also quite beautiful in gardens. And so it's so gratifying to finally have a way to deal with these issues and to realize why they're dying in our landscapes, but not out in the wild. Here's another plant. Our current uh, was dying. We treated it. Boom. Back to life. I just want to touch on the fire aspect. 
because natives have this undeserved reputation for being fire bombs. When you're in a fire, that's kind of what it looks like, guys. It is uh, embers as thick as the fire falls of Yosemite going sideways and 80 mile an hour winds and zero humidity. And we actually um, did a study, a five-year study for the United States Navy who had heard about our success with fire-resistant native landscapes. And they were very interested because they administer thousands of acres of naval housing on their reservations, completely surrounded by wildlands. So it's a big deal to have fire resistance as well as low water use, low maintenance, habitat, they're really interested in habitat, year round beauty and fire resistance. They just, that for them was like exactly what they're looking for. So they actually sponsored this study and the bottom line was that the rate of fire spread is lowest for lightly irrigated native plantings, followed by thinned natural chaparral vegetation as compared to the untreated controls. That's huge. No one has ever done a scientific research study looking at this aspect and the fact that setting up a native landscape with light irrigation can make all the difference in how it performs in fires. And also that thinning natural vegetation if you have your private rather than bulldozing it all and then coming back in flammable weeds and zero habitat, you can thin it out to about 50% coverage and have very good fire resistance as a result. Um, these benefits were, were apparent, the relationship was apparent whether it was this high slope angle or flat, and wind speed, they, they, it was always in this order. Uh, lightly irrigated first, thin and controlled. And the native plants actually maintain a much higher live fuel moisture content than traditional plants on much less water. And that the evergreen natives, like we predominantly use, like the baccarus, the manzanita, the ceanothus, exhibited the highest levels of live fuel moisture content. So no, you're not gonna plant a plant. It's not gonna native plant that's gonna spontaneously combust and burn down your house, okay? It, it, if you do some light irrigation, like two to three summer thunderstorms a month, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. I can't guarantee a house won't burn in a firestorm, okay? For a lot of reasons that may have nothing to do with a landscape, but, you know, so far so good, more than two dozen homes and these lightly irrigated hydrated native plants uh, act, act to disturb the flows of air and also as ember catchers that catch and cool the embers. So it's, it's pretty important and we're pretty proud of our success. And <clears throat> we have all these other benefits. Yeah, I mean, here's what happens when you feel, you know, we saw this over and over again, guys. People had cleared two to 300 feet, absolute environmental devastation around their homes. And the home is nothing but a pile of ash, sometimes surrounded by green palm trees and lawn, okay? And one of the things that we learned is that clearing is actually the worst thing you could do. Because at that point, the only thing to create turbulence, the only thing that that wind and embers hit is your house. There's nothing to stop it. There's nothing to disturb the flow. It goes straight into your house. You create the perfect bowling alley for embers. So clearing to bare ground all the way around your house is often not a good solution. You wanna thin by about 50%. Now, this house has been through now four fires with a native landscape, the house is fine. I want you to notice that there's an apron of decomposed granite all the way around it. So that keeps flames out from under the eaves. The native plantings are spaced out, they're lower growing. There's a lot of rocks and open space. Notice the roof is a steel roof on there, okay? So yes, this house has been through a lot. This house here, um, this was the Witch Creek fire. Uh, that fire was so hot, this streak of 
silver was actually a metal water tank that melted. This fire was so hot that the sod actually burned, okay? Yet the house is still standing. This is a metal shade structure and a concrete apron that runs around the house. These aprons are absolutely critical. You do not want to plant right up to the eaves. You actually want a space of at least three to four feet uh, uh, between the landscape and the house um, so that, again, you don't have flames getting up under the eaves. This is one of the first fire resistant homes we did in like the late 90s. And this survived the Cedar Fire and the Witch Creek Fire. And the only difference here is I probably would just run this gravel apron all the way out to the path, okay? But other than that, it did really great in the fires. It's the landscape's over 20 years old and it looks fine, it's doing fine. And the house uh, was saved. If you want, wonder what that 50% thinning looks like, I mean, it's beautiful, okay? You do it right and it looks like a park. And instead of creating a weed patch, cow pasture, environmental degradation, erosion, you use this free landscape that nature has given you and you just thin it out. You have less plants on that water supply. So the water uh, is using, utilizing less of the natural water supply. And so the plants stay better hydrated. There's less fuel, it's more opened up, but is enough of a canopy coverage that weeds are kept fairly to a minimum. So that's what that really should look like, guys, and it's beautiful. That's why we moved to these places, right? That's why we moved to the back country. So you can mow it all down, put down red apple and palm trees, right? And then watch your house burn. When you thin the chaparral, you can even have fun, put paths through it and features like bird baths and benches, and you carve out a mature native habitat rich landscape from impenetrable chaparral, and you grind it up and you put that mulch right back down to help hold the moisture and keep the weeds out of there. We're even messing around with hydrating natural vegetation. You can clearly see the difference here. It's a very light level of irrigation. We're not destroying the ecology by doing this. We give it a few thunderstorms, and it stays hydrated and green. And it takes so much, so little water to actually hydrate a native plant, okay? But look at the difference here, okay? You're creating green belts around, you can do this on a community level. That's actually the better thing to do is do this all the way around communities and create these native hydrated green belts as a transition from the natural lands to the neighborhood and create you know, 100 foot wide defensible space all the way around the neighborhood. Really trying to get that idea out there. We'd really like to start implementing this. Yeah, look at this house here. Um, you're talking about that redwood mulch. Well, notice all these plastic flags here. Notice that not all of the mulch burned. This is actually the cedar fire in 2003 that came through here. That doesn't mean this house didn't almost burn to the ground. Back in this corner, back in this uh, left corner there, there were two cords of firewood stacked against the wall. And the wife and husband got into a horrible fight. Thank God she prevailed. Got them to move the firewood over by the propane tank, which actually survived. Uh, it just gassed off. It actually worked. and. This house was built for fire. It's got a tile roof. The, the vents are all uh, covered in uh, uh, quarter inch hardware cloth. Uh, the ends of the tiles are plugged. So you don't have nests in there. You don't have a place for embers to get trapped. Um, the windows are all double paned with metal. That's very important, metal frames because the vinyl frames can melt and the windows would just fall out. And there was one other situation on this house here that caused it to almost burn. Had nothing to do with the landscape. It was actually, it was actually a, some wicker furniture that was placed back here. And it caught on fire. The flames were eight foot. And frankly, one of the neighbors had resisted the evacuation order told Cal Fire, they came back here, knocked out the door, 
tore out the drywall and put out the fire and saved the house. So nothing to do with the landscape. And here's a close up of a different area in this property. I wanted to show you these flags are actually placed, these plastic flags are placed before the fire, okay? So this is the dreaded redwood mulch that people are complaining about. Well, this is how it really behaved in the fire. And by the way, this was the last time I made this mistake of mulching and planting right up to the eaves. But in this case, it actually was serendipitous in that we could see the scorch marks on the screed line here, which are less than two inches. So you get an idea of how the intensity of this. It wasn't even enough to melt the, the marker flags, except this one, which melted not because of the mulch, but because of the burning fire uh, 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 garden hose. And also notice that a lot of the mulch actually isn't burned. It's just sort of smoldered around here. And here, the fire actually, the Harris fire actually stopped at the edge of the landscape and went all the way around. Why? Because this was a hydrate, lightly hydrated landscape. So it doesn't get much darker than this. It went around this landscape. Also a neighbor whose landscape I designed, same thing there. He calls me up, says, Ruben, your landscape saved my house. That's the kind of calls you like to get. And then it rejoined and went right up uh, Lion's Peak here and burned down this station up on top. There's actually a very dramatic video of that happening. And this uh, landscape came through completely unscathed, not even the mulch burned. In fact, it doesn't get any starker than this with this $100,000 solar array and about eight feet of native irrigated plantings and then the natural chaparral that burned as it went around the house. Back here in the witch fire, um, again, you wouldn't even realize fire came through here except for this incinerated ficus benjamina by the garage. But notice that the overhead is metal and masonry. It is not wood. That's a very important. Also notice California grapes are wonderfully hydrated. They've done very well in most native situations, okay, in most fire situations. And it's as green as the day we planted. And this is a great comparison between a Mediterranean plant and a wild native plant that are both on the same irrigation system. This was getting watered about twice a month, every 14 days. This black smudge was actually a ground cover rosemary. And this shrub over here was a buckwheat, which is usually considered a fire bomb, except in this case, it still has green leaves all over it. So basically what this is saying is that the once every two week watering was enough to keep this buckwheat hydrated to the point where it survived, but the rosemary was incinerated. It should probably be getting watered about every week in order to maintain the same level of hydration as the native plants in every two weeks. And that's important, a lot less water, same level of hydration. Greg, on that, can I stop you? We did just have a question. You hit perfectly. Sure. It was, will you please define lightly irrigated? And so you just Absolutely. touched on that once a month, once a week. <laughs> yeah, great question, guys. Um, so with these MP rotators, and by the way, you can see right here, you can actually, this, these are the old style rotors. And that's what this landscape had. And you can see that it was being lightly irrigated. By lightly irrigated, I mean... <laughs> On MP rotators, we're watering about 30 to 40 minutes once every about 10 days. So about three times a month. Sometimes on really hot exposed slopes, we'll do it once a week. Each watering at 30 minutes is less than a quarter inch of rainfall. So each month you're only putting down maybe three quarters of an inch of rainfall, equivalent rainfall. Well, you can get easily that much in a thunderstorm. We had a thunderstorm the other day. It ran, rained like an inch and a half, two inches in some areas. Okay, so it's well within the tolerance limits of the plants. Okay, but it's maintaining this really incredible fire resistant level of hydration. Look at this one. Look at that wood deck back there. Okay, the wood deck didn't burn. Now, I didn't build that wood deck. I don't know if I'd recommend it there, but it was there and it resisted the flames. 
Uh, there were some holes in it from embers that blew in and caught, but the fire department had defensible space and they were able to get in there and put it out. But the landscape is actually singed but intact and acted as ember catchers and also perturbants for the air, for the embers to move and, and instead of just a smooth flow right into the back of the house, they're going all di different direction because of the turbulence they create. So basically with an MP rotator system, we're putting the equivalent of about three quarters to one inch of equivalent rainfall per month from June to maybe September, October. So right now we're kind of shutting things down. You know, hopefully this cooling trend will last. I guess we've got a couple hot days coming up, but in general, as we get into fall and winter, unless it's a very dry year, we can often shut off the irrigation on these landscapes and don't fire it up until uh, usually June, unless we have a really bad heat wave in late May or something. And then keep it on through the end of hot summer. And you know, the amount of water we're putting on is equivalent of about maybe four to five inches of supplemental rainfall for the whole period, which, you know, is nothing, well within the tolerance. They love it, actually. And even this landscape here is intact because here's the same landscape three years later, okay? Everything is beautiful and green and happy again. So you didn't even lose the landscape. So that just gives you an idea of the, the, the true fire resistance of these plants when they're lightly hydrated. And actually, that's where I'm going to end, actually. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, take some questions here if we have any more. We did have a follow up to the watering. Um, she's asking it, it's, she assumes that includes ceanothus and other plants that are no water in summer. Uh, and I could open up uh, Laura. Hold on one sec. There we go. There I am. Okay. So the can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry, I was messing Here, with you. Here, let quick. me open up her microphone. Laura. Laura, are you muted? I do see that she's there. She is. So I have two Lauras here, McCormick and Sains. Uh, it was Sains, but okay. oh, now she's back to muted. She's playing with the mute, trying to get to work. Do you know what her question was? Assuming that includes ceanothus and other plants that are no water in summer. Uh, yes, and actually that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, this light irrigation does not saturate the warm soil, especially when you have a good mulch down. So all you're pretty much doing are wetting the leaves, wetting the mulch, and you're acting like uh, summer thunderstorms or fog drip, which most Ceanothus, especially the ground cover forms, they're from coastal areas and they get tremendous amount of fog drip during the summer. And they also have much higher levels of, of precipitation in Monterey or Central California, Central Coast. That's where a lot of these plants actually come from. That's why they have name, names like Ceanothus Yankee Point or Backer's Pigeon Point or Carmel Sur or Point Sal. Uh, these are sort of Central Coast, North Coast, uh, natives that have adapted to growing lower because they're constantly exposed to sea wind and salt spray. So uh, we, we have, that's one of the things that I have trouble finding here in San Diego County are a lot of these evergreen lower ground covers. But the Ceanothus tolerates it beautifully. A lot of times what's been blamed on overwatering or too much water is actually the ants. And Ants kind of like a little bit of moisture, so it might attract them in a little bit more. But uh, I can tell you, I, I water most of my Ceanothus lightly several times a month, and they're just happy as all get up, no problem. Uh, some of the local species might be a little more difficult. You really want to be careful with, like the 
tomentosis or uh, like uh, uh, oliganthus or uh, varicosis, those those might be a little more sensitive. But most of the horticultural ceanothuses are pretty bulletproof. We also have a question if you work with laurel sumac. I do work with it occasionally, okay. Um, I don't get a lot of demand for it. Uh, and, and kind of these um, uh, landscapes that are up again the wildland interface, they've already got laurel sumac on the property. And you don't generally want one within about 10 feet of the house. But in general, the real problem is that you need to just kind of prune them up and thin them out so there's less fuel volume. But one of the things that came out of the study, because this was actually one of the plants in our study, is that they take hydration really well and theoretically probably have the same burn characteristics as these other plants when they're hydrated. But there's such a kind of a, the fire departments have, have such a resistance to this plant that I often don't test it. So I'm not usually planted up around the house, but often in the, in, you know, farther away from the house. But I love it. It's a beautiful shrub. Yeah. And our next question is, what's the mix ratio for root soak for citrus, Catalina ironwood, and Ceanothus? Ra the mix ratio. So um, I don't really worry about it. So, you know, the, 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 the Santa Cruz Island ironwoods, the ceanothuses, you know, I just plant them according to the design. They become quite symbiotic through the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And then I'll dot in the citrus wherever, you know, usually a client will tell me, well, I want four citrus trees. And they'll give me the list of fruit. And then I'll go out and find these dwarves. And either I'll create a little growth or I'll actually kind of intersperse them. The key is that I run a separate irrigation valve to the citrus. And that way I can give them a good soaking once every seven to 10 days, let them dry out. Whereas the natives might be a little bit less water and more of an overhead type delivery. The citrus don't mind bubblers. They don't mind getting like flood irrigated as long as they're allowed to dry out. So the key with the citrus or fruit trees in general is to have them on their own irrigation for the light trees. And also suggestions for places that specialize in selling natives. Oh, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. We just had our plant sale at the California Native Plant Society. It was in Balboa Park last weekend. Uh, it went very well. Um, I highly recommend it. They have it, I think, twice a year. The California Native Plant Society San Diego chapter. So you can get on their website and look for advertisements. Um, so one of our biggest local suppliers in San Diego is Musa Creek Nursery. They're a wholesale nursery, but they make it very easy for retail customers because what you can do is get on their website. And you can find a list of nurseries that they distribute to. And then you can actually order the plants through Musa Creek, through their website, pay for them, designate what, what, nursery you want them delivered to and just they'll deliver them and you can go pick them up i mean it's really great and they have an extensive inventory of native plants so you, they have the inventory online as well so you can check out what what's available and do your order pay for it and they'll deliver it yeah it's a really great system there are also other great nurseries there is natives west down in bonita which is right on the border there and I think they occasionally have plant cells for the public, but there's also the very venerable Tree of Life Nursery, which is up in San Juan Capistrano. It's a bit of a drive, but it's a, it's a great place to visit and it's a good excuse to go up to San Juan. So uh, that's a fantastic nursery as well. And uh, they've been growing for 30, 40 years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Las Palitas Nursery which was one of my personal favorites. Uh, it was located in Escondido and they closed down a few years ago after the owner, the great Burt Wilson, unfortunately passed away. But you have other choices. And, and there are, 
Uh, Moosa Creek distributes to most ma major nurseries and they also have displays uh, plants uh, that you can purchase directly. I bet you got a good answer for this one too. Can you recommend a good book that really describes native <laughs> Well, I don't want to be overly uh, self-promotional. <laughs> uh, and there are a number of good books out there. Um, since you asked the question, I will be shame, do a shameless plug for our first book, The California Native Landscape by Greg Rubin and Lucy Warren. And the reason I say this is not just to sell books, but we're really proud of it because it was the only book that actually delved into everything we talked about and more tonight. I felt at the time that what was missing from the lexicon was a good description, not of just what plants to use. There are lots of good plant encyclopedias out there, but how to do it. And a lot of the books out there really kind of repeated the same old sort of ornamental horticultural approach, which will work for a while, but can be real problematic, especially long-term. So we delved into the natural history, the human history, the soil science, the design theory, styles, installation, maintenance, watering, just every bit of it. It was actually written as a textbook. And in fact, it's still a bestseller. It actually sold more copies in the last six months than in any six month period prior to, including when it came out. So it's, they're both going strong. The other book is more of a plant encyclopedia, The Drop Defying California Garden. For experienced people, that's probably plenty, okay? But the first book really gets into the detail. Now, my biggest influence in all of this was Burt Wilson, Las Palitas Nursery. He was my main mentor. And they have an incredible website called laspilitas.com. And it's spelled L-A-S-P-I-L-I-T-A-S.com, Las Pilitas. The nursery, they have the one location now in San Luis Obispo. And the, the website is a tour de force. And my book and that website are very consistent with one another. I was able to expand on a few concepts with increased experience in that, but it, we're all very consistent and he was where I learned. Also, Mike Evans, the Tree of Life website is excellent too. And I'm really liking uh, some of the methodology for watering that he's coming up with. There's also a lot of good books that delve more with the plants. Um, oh God, what is it called? Native Plants for Dry Climates. Uh, it's it's uh, Bart, Bart O'Brien and um, Carol uh, Bornstein and is it Dave Frost? Anyway, really good team, really good book. It's kind of blue colored. It's still selling like gangbusters out there as well. So there, there are some good books and websites out there for information. Um, I think the one reason that Timber Press was really excited about, in fact, they approached me about writing a book for them, which is a pretty rare thing. But they, when they heard our presentations, they knew we were offering something different that really wasn't out there and give people real answers. What do you do? How do you do it? Instead of, so our native plants are nice and beautiful and you should plant them, you know. And next question, can you expand on how to start the environment for the mycorrhizal fungi? Well, you know, it's kind of easy. So the best conditions for mycorrhizal fungi to exist and to formulate is actually clean, lean, mean, okay? So this landscape behind me was a giant lawn and I think they had some dying red apple on the slopes. And what we did was we came in there with sod cutters and a mini excavator. And uh, I can kind of move to the side here. You can see there's a, 
a dry stream that runs all the way through this and even right on up the slope there. And there's actually a bridge up here that the path leads to. And then this woodland, which was entirely created by us, and it becomes a woodland experience as you go through there. No soil amendments, no soil brought in. Everything was there on site, but we cleaned that upper two inches and got it out of there with all its pathogens and fertility and bacteria and you know chemicals, all that crud. And the substrate we love because it's clean, okay? The plants themselves, when you plant them, then become the inoculum for the site. Because if native plants are grown correctly, they've already got all that ecology in their root balls. You just get them into the ground, don't do anything to screw it up, i.e. fertilize or amend, okay? Water them correctly, which we like to do overhead rather than you know point saturation like a swamp ecology. And that root ball, those organisms will spread out about three foot a year. And then after a couple of years, everybody connects up into this big grid and the whole thing just stabilizes and gets incredibly drought tolerant, disease resistant, and all those good things and stable. And so really all you need to do is get rid of the foreign actors. Don't add anything that we know does not exist in the natural environment. Dig a hole, stick them in, water them like hell, try to float them out of the hole when you first put them in and put some very light irrigation, overhead irrigation like rainfall on them and put a good mulch, put the appropriate mulch, you know, that's shredded redwood bark behind me. That's what these wood shrubland communities want. And um, keep the weeds under control and let nature take its course. And they do fine. No inoculation. Everybody wants to know, what well, do you inoculate? Well, I do inoculate. It's the plants. The plants are the inoculum. And it looks like that's the rest of the questions, but we did have a comment. I can't agree with you more on using Advian trays and gels. Been using for two years. It's amazing. As soon as I find a nest, I've got a tray gel down. I cover with a clay pot to keep pets and wildlife out. And pill bugs love it too. Yeah, and so do slugs. <laughs> <laughs> they were disappearing and I got really depressed in my house because the ant bait was disappearing at night. And I'm going, oh my God, what's going on? And I went out at two in the morning and I held up my flashlight and there was a little slug party going on inside these things. And they were cleaning these things out. I don't even think it killed them, okay? I think it was just peanut butter. He just loved it. And so, yes, I love the idea of putting a clay pot or, you know, some kind of like a rock on top of it because it'll keep the raccoons and squirrels out. It won't, this, this uh, insecticide, uh, is very well tolerated by most animals, so it's, it really doesn't harm them. They do like the peanut butter, though, and the sweets. <laughs> well, there's no more questions. Thank you. Amazing. Oh, thank night. you. Thank you. I, really I apologize for the hiccups to everybody early on, and I will be sending this video in an email with information Director Myers covered and where you can find out more information about Greg. And I want to thank everybody for their time. Greg, awesome. And I want... I want to say, do you guys have that uh, rebate program going on for, yes. uh, you know, transforming your lawns into something like behind me? Okay, you can all have one. So <laughs> really pay attention to it and check it out. We'll include that in the link. Excellent. Thank you, guys. It was Thank really you. an honor and a pleasure. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.